Hello, welcome back. I am demoing today a little exercise or movement exploration that helps to introduce you to your psoas muscle. I'll talk a little bit about where the psoas muscle is and what it does. And also, I know that a lot of you might already know where the psoas muscle is and what it does, but maybe you haven't felt it before. If that's you, feel free to fast forward until you see me starting to talk about props or laying down on my back. But if you want a little bit of a, a reminder or a refresher on what this muscle is and, and why we're even talking about it, then that's where I'll head next. Your psoas muscle, and when I use the term psoas, I, the, the muscle name is spelled P-S-O-A-S, -S, pronounced psoas. And typically when you hear just the word psoas used, folks are talking about a muscle called the psoas major. It's a muscle belly that attaches to the front. I'm gonna show you my belly so you can get a sense of this. That attaches to the front of your spine, of your low spine. So here's my belly, hi belly. And I've got all of this musculature and viscera that exists in my belly. And then back here, I've got my spine. But my spine is made up of these discs, these vertebral bodies, and between those are cartilaginous discs. But imagine that your vertebral bodies were these discs of bone that stacked one on top of the other. And at the front, at the front of the bodies of those discs, and also at the side of the bodies of those discs, starts this psoas muscle. So it's deep, it's behind the muscles of my abdomen, it's behind my organs and my viscera, and it attaches at the front and the side aspects of my lumbar spine, which is the portion of the spine that sits between the rib cage and the pelvis. So kind of this region, but deep, deep, deep towards the front of your spine. And then trajectory-wise, your psoas is this long, narrow muscle that traces its way over the front of your hip joint. Here's my hip joint. You see this hip crease right here. That's my hip joint. So psoas travels deep and then comes a little bit more superficial so that it comes over the front of the pelvis and it attaches to an inner aspect of your upper thigh. There's a little bony protrusion on your thigh bone called the lesser trochanter. It's really deep to all of these other muscles that wrap around the thigh, but that is where your psoas connects to. So from the deep belly, front of the spine that's behind the deep belly, to this inner upper aspect of your thigh. What would you imagine that this muscle does? If this is the length of the muscle here, when it contracts, would it not make sense for this muscle to flex the thigh at the hip joint? And by flexion, I simply mean my thigh bone is coming closer to my torso. Extension is the opposite direction. So this is the general location of your psoas muscle and what it does. And you've got one on each side, right? Because you've got two sides to both of your vertebral bodies, to your spinal column. And since this muscle attaches to one leg, you could imagine the mirror of it attaching on the other side. Okay, I'm gonna let my belly be warm again. So this is the general region that we're exploring today. And we might all have a lot of experience with feeling the bellies, maybe doing crunches, sit-ups, abdominal exercises, exercises for the muscles at the front of the abdominal wall. But the psoas sits so deep to that, that it can be hard sometimes to feel it in its own right. And it's important, it's important to be able to feel your psoas. The psoas is hyper innervated. It's got a lot of different points of innervation. And there are a few theories behind why that is. The one that's most exciting to me is the theory that the psoas is very deeply tied to your proprioceptive sense. Proprioception being the sense of you understanding where your body is in space. So being able to walk through a crowded concert hall and not bump into everybody who's around you, or even the ability to stay upright when maybe you take a little tumble up with a twist of the ankle. These are all ways that our body and our nervous system organize in space. And this muscle that connects our legs to our spine is a really key component of organizing around that. Another theory for why this muscle is highly innervated 
is that it perhaps has a strong role to play in the body's uh, fight and flight response, specifically flight, <laughs> flight or freeze, in the sense that because it's the key hip flexor muscle, and I didn't say that, I said that it is a hip flexor muscle, but it is our primary muscle of hip flexion. So anytime that you bring this thigh forward, your psoas is ideally participating in that. So because the psoas is a primary hip flexor, it's not a far cry to imagine that it's participating anytime that you huddle into a fetal posture, into this like primal protective posture, right? So those are sort of two theories for why it's highly innervated. And the other reason that I want to introduce you all to this movement today is that ours is a culture of sitting. <laughs> A, a great, beautiful sitting culture. And the more that I educate folks about how to find a supported seat, and that's a video for another day, but this is a key part of my practice is helping people find posture that will sustain them for what they want to do with their lives. The more that I help people find a supported seat, the more I start to see evidence that the years and years of sitting, maybe in a way that's less supportive, has created a chronic dysfunction or dysregulation within the psoas. Maybe the psoas is living in a constricted state for no other reason than that that's where it typically is and so the nervous system has adapted. Or maybe the psoas doesn't know how to fire. Maybe it's been taken offline to an extent by the brain because we're not actively using it or thinking about intentionally using it in some of the functional everyday movements. So that's the psoas. That's why we're here talking about the psoas. Let's get into it. We're going to be working from the floor, which as you know, this is one of my primary tools. So if you have trouble getting up and down from the floor, reach out to me and we can come up with something specific to you. And what we need is something that's going to be able to lift our pelvis away from the floor. We've done this in the past with a yoga block. Here's what one yoga block looks like. For today, if you're gonna use a yoga block, think about using two yoga blocks, just a little bit of a broader stack. So that's sort of like a yoga block bench. And if you're going to use yoga blocks, which is how I will demonstrate this, I would also recommend having a blanket or a towel that you can drape over your yoga block bench to soften the edges because the pelvis is gonna be articulating with the edges of your yoga blocks. And I want you to be comfortable and not feeling like you're distracted by that articulation of the edges of your yoga blocks and your pelvis. Another option, if you're in the yoga world, would be to use a bolster. My bolster is not as tall as a yoga block, nor is it as firm. So in the effort to do something or put something underneath our pelvis that's gonna lift it up, this is gonna be a, a lower, um, lower amplitude, lower amplitude height. Also, let me unplug our little refrigerator down here so you don't hear that, or so I don't hear that. Okay, so this would be maybe a little bit of a lower amplitude elevation. If you wanted to go higher amplitude, you could ditch the blanket and set your bolster on top of your block bench. These are all options. If you don't have blocks or a bolster, you could think about using a couple of really thick books. They need to be about the same height. It is possible to do this on the width of just one block. I have just found it's more comfortable to use two blocks. And if you don't own yoga blocks, but you want to get in touch with me, I can sell you some or point you to a website where you can get some affordably. Okay, so I am going to use the bench that I've created out of my yoga blocks and the blanket setup that I discussed before. I'm going to slide this off the side of my mat to start and come down to my back. Come down to my back, set my feet down on the mat, or if you're not working with the mat, just set your feet on the floor. See if you can feel with your feet on the floor about hip width distance apart. See if you can feel where the back of the pelvis is coming into contact with the floor. If you were a cartographer and you were tracing the outline of the continent of the back of the pelvis and the places where the pelvis meets the floor, where would those boundaries be? Good. 
And now here, let's think about our psoas again. You can even use your hands. You could bring the palms, the heels of your hands kind of up a little bit on either side of the belly button or maybe a little bit higher and let your fingertips drift down towards your hips. So I'll show you from the front. You could do something like this with your hands just to trace the movement or the, um, the path of the psoas muscle. And here with our knees bent, feet on the mat, we're in a little bit of hip flexion, right? So in this state, the psoas is a little bit shortened. It might not be contracted, meaning it might not be working, but it is in a shorter state than if it was not in a shorter state. What I mean by that is with the knees bent and the thighs pointing skyward like this, the muscle is not in its longest state, which would happen when you reach your leg long and lower the heel to the ground, okay? Because that insertion point, the inner upper thigh region, gets farther away from your low spine when you extend your leg long. So go ahead and do that with both of your legs just to see how it feels. And maybe you could imagine under those hands that the psoas muscle was getting just a little bit longer under your hands. So what we're going to do is we're going to find that same idea of moving from thigh in close to thigh extended long, but we're going to lift the pelvis up. And by lifting the pelvis up away from the mat, you're going to get even more length from the low back, from the low spine to that insertion point in the inner upper thigh. Okay. There are a few ways to do this to keep the low back protected, so don't skip ahead. That was just a little preview and a logic for why we're doing what we're doing. Okay, so bend your feet, feet back under the knees, reach for your uh, block bench or your bolster or whatever it is that you're going to use and sidle that up right alongside the side of your pelvis. Press into your feet, lift your pelvis up, use your hands to slide whatever it is that you're using at the back of the pelvis under the back of the pelvis, and then set the pelvis down. Okay, so first things first, see if you can feel into the back of the pelvis and make sure, think back to when you were a cartographer, a map maker, and see if you can feel that the same area at the back of the pelvis is now in contact with either your block bench or your bolster or whatever it is that you're using. Make sure that it's still in contact with that and that you're not feeling like you're tucking your tail or reaching your tail into the blocks. I want you to feel like you're sort of at a neutral point compared to your starting position. Okay, first things first, let's pick up one foot. You can keep the knee nice and bent. Think about stacking the knee over the hip and then pick up the other foot. So in this case, we're actually shortening or contracting the psoas even more. And let's start by activating the psoas muscle on the left side. Bring your left hand to the front of your left thigh and you can even stack your right hand on top of that left hand. Your right leg's just hanging out, knee stacked over hip, be as passive there as you can. But start to brace your hands and your arm against the front of your left thigh and then draw this left thigh back into your hands. So you're really actively pressing your thigh into your hands, pressing your hands into your thigh so it's not going anymore. So this is an isometric contraction because the bones are not moving, but the psoas ideally is firing, right? If it knows how to fire, it's firing right now because this is an isometric hip flexion action. Hold it for three, two, one, and then release. Don't go anywhere, just release the effort. Next, bring your hands to your right thigh and start to draw that thigh in a little bit closer to your belly. You're gonna start to feel the pelvis rocking back a little bit, that's okay. What I'm doing is I'm asking the pelvis to have a little bit of this backward tilt first, and then I'm gonna ask you to slowly start to reach your left heel forward, okay? So extend through that left knee and then float that left heel down towards the mat. All right, so my left heel just landed. So this, this 
holding the right thigh in towards the belly is a huge portion of what's protecting the lower back. Okay, if you were to do this with both legs, you need to be so careful and, so, and listen so much to what your nervous system and your back is saying. But keeping this right thigh knee hugged in is helping to create a little bit of a counter torsion in the pelvis while still introducing an increased amount of length between the two attachment sites of psoas on the left side. Okay, so you could think about like inching that left heel forward a little bit more you could even think about reaching the left arm overhead. There's all of this fascial connection from the left side core up to the left side shoulder. And sometimes reaching that left arm overhead helps to create a sense of length in that fascial connection. The other important thing is to start breathing into your belly. Actually, before you do that, maybe bring your hand one more time, your left hand one more time to where you imagine the psoas would live. It might be counterintuitive. It might feel like you're stretching a belly muscle. I mean, the psoas is a very deep core muscle, right? It lies behind all of those contents of the belly. So just know where it is so that you know maybe what you're feeling if you do start to feel it. Try to keep your left toes pointed skyward if you feel yourself rolling with your left toes out to the left and just be conscious of that and try to keep that leg neutral without a rotation. Okay, now you can reach the left arm back overhead. See if you can invite a sense of softening at the front of the left low belly and the front of the left hip joint where that hip crease is. And then with your breath, imagine that with your next five or six rounds of breath, you could take a deep belly breath. And when I say deep, it doesn't need to be like deep volume, but directionally, could you imagine filling up the very bottom portion of your lungs so that the diaphragm shifts around the contents of the belly and gives the psoas a little bit of a massage here as it's lengthened. Keep inviting a sense of softening at the front of the belly and the front of the hip, even as you continue to breathe, even as you continue to invite the left toes and the left knee skyward. Take two or so more rounds of breath. Okay, to come out of this, you can bring the left arm back to the belly or you can rest it at the pelvis. Slowly start to drag that left heel back towards your seat and just set the left foot on the mat. My mat crinkled up a little bit. Release your right leg with your right hand and slowly start to set the right foot back down as well. Let's come off of whatever it is that the pelvis is propped up upon. So you can just lift the pelvis, use your hands to slide that apparatus out from underneath you. Pause for a moment with knees bent, feet on the mat, maybe feeling at the front of the belly, front of the two hip joints, and then slowly extend one leg and then the other. So we're coming back to that starting position where we're, we're in more of hip extension, but not actively stretching per se. Take a couple or three more rounds of belly breath and just see what it feels like on your two sides here. If you can let go of the need to have the toes and the knees pointing skyward, this is just a little bit of a opportunity to invite the brain to drop into your two psoas muscles. Cool. Okay. Let's do the second side. Bring your feet back to the floor, knees bent, reach for whatever it is that's going under your pelvis and then lift the pelvis, slide your bench or your bolster underneath said pelvis. 
And once again, we're starting by feeling into the back of the pelvis. Tune back into your map. Make any adjustments that you need to find your way back to that neutral starting position. And then pick one foot up and the other. Let's start by activating the right psoas. So bring your right hand to the front of your right thigh. Left hand can stack on top of the right. Left leg can just kind of hang out where it is. Left knee stacked over the left hip. And then actively draw your right thigh in towards your hands. You keep your arms braced, hands pressing that right thigh so that the thigh doesn't actually move. But you are activating the muscles that move you into hip flexion. Yeah. All right, keep holding for five, four, three, two, and one. <laughs> Release that effort. Now you're bringing your hands to your left thigh. You're starting to draw that left thigh in towards your torso. Be gentle, be slow, feel how you start to shift back on your pelvis. Your tail starts to curl and lift up a little bit. This is gonna help us to protect the low back from overextension as we slowly start to reach the right heel forward, extending at the back of the right leg, and then lower the right heel down towards the floor. So I said at the start that the height of what you're putting under your pelvis matters. This is where it matters. For me, having the blocks underneath the pelvis with a little bit more height and a little bit more firmness creates a deeper sense of a stretch for me. You could go higher, but you would need to move slowly and just be sure that your system is able to integrate that degree of extension at the hip. You could go lower if you feel like this is overexertion or like you're not able to actually find yourself here, right? It's important to be able to feel where your body is in space. So if you can't, think about going lower with what's under your pelvis. So first things first, make sure that your toes on the right foot and the right knee are pointed towards the sky. You could think about inching that right heel a little bit farther forward. Good. And then maybe you bring the right hand back to where you imagine the, the upper reaches of your psoas muscle to live. Kind of to the right, maybe starting above the belly button, the fingers trace down towards the hip joint towards the hip crease. Can you feel or invite a sense of softening at the front of the right belly, the front of the right hip, and maybe even into the front of the right thigh? If it feels like it would be interesting and appropriate, you could reach that right arm overhead noticing if or how that changes your experience. And continue to breathe, but start to think about bringing that breath really deep into the lungs and into the belly. How does it feel to inhale? How does it feel to exhale? keeping a sense or an invitation towards softness on the right side in particular. Nice. Okay. If your right arm's overhead, you can bring it back to either the outer right pelvis or the floor. Slowly start to drag the right heel back towards your seat. You can plant your foot once that right heel is under the right knee. And then slowly lower the left heel back down. Pausing for a moment. And then press into your feet, lift up your pelvis, shift your prop set up out from underneath you. And then as you're ready, you can lengthen both legs again. Good. You 
You might find that you feel more of this when you stand up, but take your time coming from lying down to standing up or even to seated. You can bend the knees again, turn to one side, press yourself up. And however you wanna make your way upright, come on upright. Just sit back so that maybe y'all can still see my face. So notice how it feels at the front of the, the hip joints, how the belly feels like it's relating to the thighs. Maybe take a few steps forward, backwards. Can you continue to map a sense of connection from your spine to your legs? And maybe it's quieter than it was. Maybe walking feels easier. Maybe it feels harder. Change is expected. It's okay if you don't feel a change. You might try to bring this into your practice or into your movement curriculum once a week or twice a week, um, especially if you're somebody that sits a lot, which is a lot of us. So I hope you felt something. <laughs> if you didn't, I'm happy to work with you in a one-on-one -on -one capacity to help with that. Um, I'm always interested in helping folks feel some of the deeper reaches of themselves. So thanks for being here. Have a good rest of your day.